sounds like you're making a firm bet against uh, the critics of artificial intelligence who say that in theory it's philosophically impossible to uh, that's right. replicate uh, human intelligence. Uh, uh, I see their arguments as faulty mm -hmm. and um, I don't see that uh, human intelligence is something that humans can never understand. So when I was first at Stanford, I was in the office right next to John McCarthy, who is the legendary great who founded the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. I remember John McCarthy would always challenge me to think deeper about a problem, broader about a problem, advance it more. He was the kind of individual that would have that deep kind of intellectual engagement. And the naming of artificial intelligence is normally attributed to John McCarthy organizing a summer conference at Dartmouth in the 1950s. When I arrived at Stanford in 1965, the theme of the first generation of AI was largely a pursuit of generality in the models of cognition. And Stanford was a leader in that area, that we were in many ways the home of using formal logical inference to try and model the kind of intelligent behavior of a rule-based system or an expert system. The second decade of AI's work came to be dominated by these programs. Expert systems are programs for which the intent of the designer is that the program exhibit expert level competence or beyond expert level competence. Well, Stanford was one of the early uh, pioneers in artificial intelligence. Even when I arrived in the 70s, it was already a hotbed of research. So when I got here in 73, it was really an amazing place. They had set up the artificial intelligence lab in this circular wooden modernistic building a mile up in the hills above the campus. I get the sense that it was a seriously playful place, but really at the same time, it was actually pioneering things like computer music, computer art. And there was a room in the AI lab dedicated to computer music research where John Chowning worked at night. And in John's words, it was as to not abuse our hosts. There was this energy of people doing just all kinds of projects. There was this huge robot arm that filled one room, that picking things up, moving them. There was a cart that rolled around the countryside, around the building. The work that I was doing at that time in understanding language by computer, I always tell people it's the great, 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 great grand ancestor of Siri. But then a second revolution started, this new approach of building artificial neural networks. That was something that was first tried in the 1950s, and it was tried again in the 1980s. And indeed, one of the most prominent people from the 1980s work is Jay McClellan. I was fortunate to be able to come into an environment that had an incredibly strong reputation in the field of artificial intelligence, driven by people like Ed and John and, and others, but also at a time of opportunity because there were some incredible young people who were emerging in other parts of the world as graduate students um, that were more representative of the new style of AI. But because we were looking to sort of expand the group and rebuild it, there was the opportunity to bring them in and hire a new guard, if you will. And so I was really in this fortunate position of being able to hire amazing young colleagues like Sebastian Thron and Andrew Ng and Fei-Fei Li and Chris Manning and others to really create a department that turned out to be one of the strongest departments, arguably maybe the strongest department in the world in this new style of AI because we had the opportunity to bring in such amazing young faculty. One of the things that came out of this effort on dealing with the realities of physical systems, systems that are embedded in the real world, was Sebastian Thrun's work and that of others on Stanley which was the first time that there was this successful autonomous car. So it was a defining project that brought a lot of people together across different groups. It wasn't until a decade ago the real potential of those uh, approaches for solving the kinds of intelligence that we were interested in became real. Then I think of Andrew Ng being one of those who 
pursued neural network ideas during the period when they were, you know, less popular. The first big success of deep learning happened in vision. ImageNet was a project that we carried out in 2006, where my students and I collecting a internet scale data set of diverse objects and images, we can refocus the algorithm development of computer vision tasks towards that real world scenario. When combined with neural networks, the scale of ImageNet made it possible for machines to achieve human-like recognition of objects for the first time. And that combination formed the basis of a whole world of deep learning applications. How are you? Stanford came in the 2000s, a leading lab for doing natural language processing research. And that's led to um, the speech recognition that everyone now has on their cell phone. So many inventions and startups and big companies coming out of this place. And the reason for this is because Stanford creates this place where people dare things and go for the big ideas. Ocean One is uh, bringing a new capability uh, for underwater exploration. This was a wonderful example of the kind of things that you can do once you have autonomous machines that can provide new capabilities that can augment what humans can do in exploring the planet. Stanford had an incredible leadership role in the marriage of machine learning and biology and health that has been tremendously impactful in reshaping the field of biology. How do we take biological data, medical data, and use the kind of statistical modeling techniques that were developed more broadly within AI and machine learning to try and make sense and extract significant insights about human biology from those data sets? I think AI for All has been a part of the vision to really uh, embrace a wider community in the development of artificial intelligence. Feifei and Olga believe it was really a societal imperative to be looking at an artificial intelligence that responds to the needs and interests of the many, not only a subset of society. In order to train AI to benefit humanity, the creators of AI need to represent humanity. One of the things I love about Stanford is there is a critical mass of women researchers in the Stanford AI lab leading research at the faculty level, as well as at being graduate students and undergraduate students. Stanford Institute for Human-Centered AI, which we call HAI, was launched in the spring of 2019. The mission of HAI is to advance AI research, education, policy and practice to better human conditions. Having been involved in the field of artificial intelligence for a long time, um, Stanford has had the benefit of training many of the researchers around the world who are going on to really push the field forward. And that's helped spread this discipline the best thinking, the wild new ideas just come from having really smart people with an opportunity to think about um, what could be done and what should be done. I just look at colleagues and the overall spirit of the community for uh, examples of that kind of um, daring leadership. When you bring together great students and great faculty, uh, marvelous things can happen. <laughs>